G'day, I'm Paul. So we've worked our way through the Ranger lineup, but now it is time for the Everest. And we're kicking off with the Everest Platinum, which is the top specification version of the new Ford Everest. Now this competes with things like the Toyota Prado, the Mitsubishi Pajero Sport, the Isuzu MUX. It is kind of in a market here where you have ute-based SUVs. Now, this being the top specification, it is just under $80,000. It has crept up in price, but it does come with a stack of features that I'll run you through shortly. Uh, if that's too expensive though, the whole range kicks off but not much over $50,000. So they really do have a lot of options there within that price band. Today, we're gonna to do a detailed review of this SUV. So if you do wanna skip ahead to other parts of this review, you can use the time codes on the screen, or if you're on YouTube, you can scroll down and use the chapters below. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel, press the bell icon, because that's gonna tell you every single time we review a platinum. Let's talk design. So you've got six external colors to pick from. All but white is gonna cost you just under $700. Now. Let me just run you through the dimensions quickly. So Everest has grown, so it sits on a longer wheelbase, so it's 50 mil longer, and it also sits on a wider track, 50 mil wider. And that's important because I always, whenever you see an Everest on the road, like the previous generation, it always kind of looks weird up the top there. This actually looks like it has a decent stance to it now, and it really has quite a presence out on the road. I love the treatment here with the platinum as well. So I could take or leave the lettering on the bonnet there, but I do love this sort of brushed aluminium look and the 3D elements on that grille. Big Ford logo go there as well with a camera up the front and a little washer built into that. Down the bottom here, you've got radar, cruise control, parking sensors as well, and then cooling for the V6 diesel here. Now, I did notice something here that I wanna call out, and that is the fit and finish on this bonnet. We actually noticed it on a Ranger that we borrowed the other day that I hadn't noticed previously, but you can see it doesn't sit flush with that. So I don't know whether that's been not fitted well at the factory or something like that, but um, yeah, hopefully this isn't a sign of things to come in terms of reliability. Uh, headlights, you have a set of full matrix LED headlights with that C-clamp LED daytime running light. You have an LED fog light down the bottom there as well. Let's whip around to the side. 21 inch alloy wheels. These are whoppers. Now this sits on a highway terrain tie, but you can get an off-road pack for Everest as well. It comes with all terrains. And I think that's gonna be important if you do any off-road driving, the all terrains are the ones to go for. They will come with a smaller wheel as well. The other thing with the 21 inch wheel, these brakes look almost comically small when you look at this from the side. And I know that it's um, obviously not much you can do about that, but yeah, the bigger the wheel you go, the smaller the brakes look. And in this instance, they kind of just look a little bit too small in my opinion. Uh, up the top here, you don't have that sort of black cladding. This is all body colored and I think this looks really nice. And this color as well, I really like that. V6 badge on the side here. If you do go for the four cylinder, that says buy turbo. A little bit of that brushed aluminum there as well with some extrusions there that expose this element. This is hydroformed, so you do actually have uh, space in here for cooling. And this is also where they fit some of the components for the engine. Just like the Ranger, the V6 Everest, and also the four cylinder, you can fit with a second battery under the bonnet there as well, should you so desire. Up the top here, you have body color for that wing mirror, indicator built into there, 360 camera on the side here. Very powerful LED light here as well, because this has 360 degree zone lighting. More platinum badges on the side there. Side steps. I do like that this has a little bit of color to it, because in the Ranger, if you don't go for the wrappers, it's all just kind of very plasticky and not very nice looking, but Still, I don't know. Plastic just doesn't really do it for me. I'm just wondering if there's another material they could have used down here just to give this a little bit more presence, I reckon. Uh, you've got privacy glass, roof rails up the top here, and then come around to the back. Platinum again, just so no one forgets that you're driving the platinum. LED tail light, so that wraps around the side there. Quite a good looking tail light at night time as well. Four wheel drive down the bottom there, and then Everest down here as well. This now has a three and a half ton braked towing capacity. Look, if you are gonna be towing three and a half tons, it is the V six that you want to go for. It really has the punch that you need to tow something that size. And if you do get the tow package from Ford, it actually comes with an integrated brake controller inside the cabin as well. That also allows you to configure the size of the trailer so that you can also have support for blind spot monitoring uh, within that length of the trailer, which I think is a really cool feature. In addition to that, you have camera down here, Ford badge just here, high mounted stop lamp here, and then a aerial up the top there. Uh, the other thing I wanted to call out as well is that this, unlike the Ranger, gets coil sprung rear. You also have a Watts linkage too, so it should mean that it actually rides quite nicely. So I'll be keen to go for a drive and see how it performs. Now, let me know in the comments section below, do you like the design of this? Do you think that the, the sort of increase in dimensions has actually helped it? Let me know what you reckon down there. So we are inside the Everest. We'll start off with the key. So you have unlock, 
lock the boot button then on the back of it you have the Ford logo there it's a proximity sensing key so you can leave that in your pocket once you're inside you have a push button start here attached to the steering column so let's talk about the design first so if you've seen our other Ranger reviews this kind of looks very familiar to that but there are a few other design highlights here that I actually quite like and that are unique here to Everest so you get wood grain here on the dashboard I think that actually looks really nice a little bit of this aluminium strip there as well and then a platinum badge up the top there that wood grain continues around the door here as well so really sort of nice looking setup and I just love the size and appearance of this big screen in the center here um, so what about your touch points nice and soft in the center there soft on the door as well how soft are they we've got our gyrometer we've tested the main surfaces in this cabin if you want to see how this car compares to others that we've tested before look at the link in the description below now builds quality given the bonnet situation over there what's it like yeah, a little bit of flex there. That's a little bit loose there as well. Let's try our door. Door sounds really nice and solid. So let's talk about infotainment. I mentioned that this is kind of the centerpiece to the interior here. So it's a 12 inch display with the SYNC 4 operating system. I have mentioned this in our previous Ranger reviews. I feel like the bigger version of this screen is just a little bit slower and laggier than the smaller 10 inch version. You'll notice when you're sort of going through some of the menus, it's fine now, but if they're not preloaded, they just take a little bit of time to sort of wake up and start doing their thing. Once it is moving, it's fine. And these controls down here are a little bit tricky to use while you're on the move so when you go to click on them you need to need to be quite accurate with your clicks otherwise it doesn't actually register you'll see there I've really got to spend a lot of time actually clicking on that and it is hard to do while you're driving so a couple of little things they can fix there hopefully with a software update because it is capable of over the air updates down the track as well uh, this has inbuilt wi-fi as well as a hotspot so you can get other people to connect into the car if you need to uh, it has emergency services uh, built into it as well so it is really quite a comprehensive system satellite navigation comes standard on this as well that is if you don't have a smartphone paired to it but in terms of your smartphone connectivity not only do you have apple carplay and android auto both of those are wireless so i'll show you what apple Apple CarPlay looks like. So there it is there. You can adjust the size of that screen too. So you can increase the size of your um, uh, shortcut buttons down here, or you can go down the path of having a bigger uh, smartphone mirroring display there. And this is what Android Auto looks like. So again, similar setup, you can adjust the size of that screen if you want to, so pretty impressive. In terms of audio, you have AM, FM, DAB, digital radio. You also have a 12-speaker B&O Play branded sound system. It's a really good sound system, and for something like this size of car, it's actually pretty impressive how much bass you get and um, you know, how immersive it is, so really like that setup. Now, also different to Ranger outside of Raptor, this actually gets the big digital display here ahead of the driver. So 12.3-inch display, fully animated and as you move through the drive modes all of that changes as you go so really like that setup and it looks very high-end and premium as well now what about your safety tech obviously big family suv that stuff is important uh, in addition to the nine airbags and a center airbag as well which is what they needed for the five star safety rating you have autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian and cyclist detection you have an auto dimming rear vision mirror you have a blind spot monitor built into the wing mirror over there and as i mentioned earlier if you do have a trailer hooked up and you set the length of the trailer that blind spot monitor will actually cover the length of the trailer as well, which is a really, really good feature. In addition to that, you have radar cruise control with the semi-autonomous steering function. We'll actually test that out later on and see how well it performs in our banked bowl. And then you also have rear cross traffic alert on the parking front. You have front and rear parking sensors and the 360 cameras. So I'll show you what that looks like. Here it is there. So quality of that is pretty decent. Uh, you can see out the front there uh, pretty clearly. This is your top down view. It is a little bit sort of warped on those outer edges there and you don't really get the best sort of uh, angles there. But if we go down here to the different views, you get um, the sonar set up there. You can see our suitcases at the back. So you get those little lines come up. This is a wide angle view of the front. This is your view of the back. And then you also have a trailer hitch view as well. So really impressive setup there in terms of camera coverage. So practicality, we'll start off with your connectivity. Down the bottom here, you've got a USB-C outlet, a USB-A outlet in the center console. You have a 12 volt outlet. And then up the top here, you have a USB-A outlet for dash cam. Where are you gonna put your phone? Well, there is actually wireless phone charging down here. So you can rest your phone on that charging pad or alternatively, you can kind of put it wherever you want. There is even 
little chip holder down there that can rest your phone in as well. Now, coffee cups. So if you do have a pool size coffee cup, it fits into there without any problems. By the way, when we were in the States recently reviewing the new Mercedes-Benz EQS SUV, uh, American Paul had a much bigger coffee cup. So <laughs> you can see that you can get a variety of things in there. Now, teeth in there as well to hold your bottle and coffee cup. So you can see that that won't move around too much. I'm gonna put the bottle inside the door and we'll try our big bottle as well. Well, we'll see how that goes. Yes, that fits inside the door too, very good. What about your other storage? So over here, you actually have cup holders in front of the air vent. So uh, I think that is a great feature and it means that if you do have a hot drink on a cold day, the heater will keep it nice and warm and vice versa if it is cold. You have one on the driver's side, one on the passenger side as well. Center console, nice and big in there. You have a little storage tray there for coins and odds and ends. Glove box. Pretty reasonably sized. You have a secondary glove box up the top here. And then finally, you have a sunglasses holder right up the top of the cabin as well. So comfort, uh, you've got a fair few sort of little bits and bobs here. So dual zone automatic climate control up the front here. In addition to that, you have heated and cooled seats for the front row, heated steering wheel. The seats themselves are really comfy. So they hug you in nicely. They've got these perforations here for cooling. You also have a platinum badge up the top there as well, which is pretty cool. The seats are fully electrically adjustable for the driver and front passenger. You can go forwards, backwards. Backrest can go forwards, backwards. Front of the seat can go up. Back of the seat can go up. And then you also have lumbar adjustment as well. You have three-way memory for the driver. The steering wheel offers both tilts and reach adjustment. And on our reach test, all of this stuff is easy to reach while you're driving. Okay, second row of the Everest. What do we reckon? Um, look, knee room is pretty good. I have my seat pretty far back, so that's actually not too bad. Uh, toe room is okay. Headroom is not too bad. So the interesting thing is when I was in the back of the Ranger, it, um, it was okay. Raptor was a little tighter, I think, because of the seats. But um, look, this is okay. I was hoping for maybe a little bit more room back here, but that'll be fine. Uh, in terms of your creature comforts, you do have heated seats here for the two outboard seats. You have blower controls here for this zone. You have USB-C and USB-A connectivity. You have map pockets just there. You've got the center armrest here that you can rest your elbow on, but you also have two cup holders in there. Pop the bottle in there if you need to. The bottle can then go inside the door, so you've got room there for odds and ends. Your air vents are located just up here so you can put those on your face if you want to. It's actually quite a handy feature because if you have a rearward facing baby seat in here, often the air vents that are located down here don't really work that well, whereas that can blow directly down onto the baby. So um, I think that's actually a much better way to be doing things. ISO fix points on the two outboard seats with three top tether points as well. And what about our window test? So it's auto up and down, boom, all the way down. That is very impressive there from Everest. So KFC lovers, if you're out there like me, can you fit an adult KFC lover in the third row? So you have a couple of ways of folding this, uh, but the easiest way to access the third row is fold and push it all the way forward. And then let's try climbing in here. Let's see how this goes. I'll also bring this back as well. So uh, it's not great. Let me just go forward a touch. I'll bring it up to there. There we go. So in this setting, my knees are kind of, they have just enough room. Toe room is tight, but okay. And headroom, my hair is sort of just touching the ceiling. It's actually not terrible though. I thought it was gonna be a whole lot worse. So you've got storage off to the sides here. You've got a 12 volt outlet over here as well. Now, Igor, can you just show us how much uh, knee room there is there in front of the seat? So you can see that it is a little compromised there, but I think if you wanted to fit a KFC loving adult like myself in the back here, it would be fine for short trips. Kids certainly wouldn't have any issues here at all. Then on top of that, these two seats also have top tether points as well. So you can put baby seats in uh, all five seats in this car, which I think is pretty awesome. Um, but let's see how much boot room there is because I think that's probably gonna be a little compromised. So let me show you how much room you do have. So behind the third row, you have just under 300 litres of cargo space. The reason this is so limited is uh, in pretty much all of these, I guess, SUVs based on dual cab utes, they try and push that third row as far back as they can. And it does mean that you get limited space here. So we'll try to load our bags in in just a second, but you do have 12 volt outlet off to the side here, little LED light there. 
Have a look at this, I thought this was interesting. So under floor here, you have a little bit of storage there for odds and ends. Here they show it's snorkels, boots, and a t-shirt. But this is where you're gonna find access to your spare wheel. It is a full-size spare under there. You remove this cap, but they also have this, and this is totally over-engineered, but I just love it anyway. So you have these little things here to hold all this up while you're changing your tire or doing whatever you need to do, and then all of your tools are under here. So really nice little setup there. I thought that was quite impressive. Um, get this out of the way. We'll try to put our bags in now. We'll see how that's gonna go. I'm wondering if we can fit our suitcase in. So laptop fits in there. Suitcase. Oh, easy. No dramas at all. So it's actually not too bad there in terms of practicality of that storage space. This is also cool as well. So I mentioned earlier, we just reviewed the uh, Mercedes EQS SUV. It's probably going to be over 300 grand when it gets to Australia. And <laughs> the third row was manual on that. This, on the other hand, is electric. So that just disappears out of the way. You can see those top tether points there as well. With that out of the way, you have just under 900 litres of space. I'll show you what that looks like. So bag in there, big bag in there. So no dramas there at all. Now, if you do want even more space, what you can do is fold this down. And then once that second row is folded, it's pretty much flat. It climbs up a little bit there, but you have just over 1800 litres of space back here. So we have just hit the road in the Ford Everest. Look, I think this is the engine this car needed the whole time. So turbocharged V6 diesel, we've tested this engine in Ranger as well, and we're pretty impressed with it, especially on the dyno. Uh, if you haven't seen that video before, click up here to watch that. We actually stuck the Raptor, the V6 wild track, and the four cylinder wild track on the dyno to see how they would perform. And the V6 diesel actually really came up nicely. It does feel like it's torque limited in first and potentially second, but once it gets up and moving, it really has some mumbo and that is because it is a really decent engine so three liter turbo charged v6 diesel it makes 184 kilowatts of power and 600 newton meters of torque that is a fairly decent chunk and it's all mated to a 10 speed automatic transmission now the transmission it has undergone some changes over the previous generation of this car and the v6 has its own calibration as well that means that when you are driving along you sink the slipper in dials back really nice and quickly and it is such a smooth engine it is just so nice and exactly where it needs to be suits the character of the car perfectly now typically what's happening is you select where it's sending the torque so for efficiency you can run it in two-wheel drive high range or you can run it in four-wheel drive automatic if you remember the previous generation of Everest unless you specifically got the rear-wheel drive version you it was basically permanent all-wheel drive here you actually have the choice of selecting which drive mode you want then in addition to that, you have four high and four low, and we'll do a little bit of light off-roading later. I'll run through those along with these drive modes as well to, to show you how all that works. But for the most part, it is a very straightforward setup. And for me, I'd probably just run it in four auto the rest of the time because that is all you need. You really don't need to be faffing around with two-wheel drive high range uh, like you do in the Raptor if you're doing any fun drifty things. Now let's talk fuel economy. Ford claims 8.5 litres per 100 Ks. We're currently sitting on 11.3. So I think Ford's numbers are very, very optimistic because um, yeah, even if I drop down to the earlier cycle here, 10.9, still much higher than eight and a half. And I think that if you are using this realistically day to day in and around the city, perhaps towing with it, it is probably gonna chew through a little bit of fuel. So uh, keep that in mind if you're getting the V6 over the four cylinder. Now there is no sport mode here, but I'm gonna pop this into four auto. We'll go for a little stab around our track here. See what this feels like. So. A little bit of body roll there. It's actually not too bad. It's very predictable. Like when you tip it in, it does have that body roll, but I can just lean on the throttle. And then in four auto, it's just feeding torque through all four wheels. It's just doing a commendable job of keeping everything nice and composed. And look, this is in a sports car. They do a sport model. So I'll be keen to see if that's any better, but uh, keeping in mind that this is running on the highway terrain. So they give this just that little bit of added traction. If you go for the all terrains, you're probably gonna run out of traction a little earlier. It will be better for off-road driving, but if you are planning on predominantly sticking on road, I'd stay with the highway terrains. Let's see what it's like on our back straight here. I'm just curious to see what Everest is like when it comes to, to the higher speed stuff, like overtaking. I'm rolling onto the back straight here. I'll just stay on that throttle. He's actually really composed at high speed. I wouldn't dare do anything like this in a Prado. <laughs> This actually feels really good. We are actually nudging, uh, nudging 160 there. That's not too bad. Yeah, 
pretty impressed with that. So look, it is it is big. It does feel big, but it's very predictable. Every input is just, it has a response that you are expecting it to have. So yeah, pretty impressed with how this feels behind the wheel. Okay, so there is no sport mode, but I thought we'd try our luck at zero to 100 here with the V-Box. I'm gonna do this twice, once in two wheel drive high range, and then once in four wheel drive auto. And I'll go up to 120 as well, so we can see what our overtaking range aided at 120 is like. So here we go, I'll load up a few revs, just stand on it. All right. This feels slightly leisurely compared to Ranger, but that's all right. 100 and 120 I'll dive on the brakes there okie dokie so 0 to 100 9.4 seconds and 80 to 120 number 6.7 seconds so yeah it is surprising I would have thought this would be a little snappier there especially with V6 diesel I'll be keen for us to try out the four cylinder to see how much slower that is in comparison. But let's give that another try this time around in full drive auto. Okay, let's give that one more shot. I'm in 4A at the moment, so uh, we'll just go straight up to 120 again and we'll see what happens. Here we go. Okay, that was better. So nine seconds, zero to 100, and 6.7 seconds, 80 to 120. So it does look like it makes a little bit of a difference there by selecting for auto, and nine seconds, zero to 100, it's fine. I'm not sort of too blown away with it. Um, I thought it could be maybe a little bit quicker with a big punchy V6 diesel. Okay, time for our all important reverse speed test. Here we go, slide that into reverse. Smash the throttle. A fair bit of torque there. Uh, 38 k's an hour is our limit in reverse. Let's talk about the ride. So the ride is, is actually remarkably good despite the fact we're on 21 inch alloy wheels. In and around town, it's nice and smooth. It doesn't feel ute-like at all. And that is, you know, there's, there's a quantum difference between the Ranger and the Everest, which I really love. It means you're not just buying a ute with seven seats. This feels like its own standalone vehicle. Uh, and that's really going to come in handy when you are driving through the country and it does show you how much effort they put into tuning this for Aussie conditions. So what's it like over our sine waves? Let's dial up 130 k's an hour. So keeping in mind that this is coil sprung, it uses a watts linkage at the rear, whereas the Ranger outside of Raptor is leaf sprung. I would expect this to be a little more settled over this stuff. So there's 130. Yeah, it's okay. It's not amazing, it doesn't really have a great deal of body control at the top end there, it sort of floats a little bit. It does have that sort of added weight that keeps it down, so it tips the scales are just under 2,500 kilos, so that helps keep it down, but once you do get a little bit of that oscillation, which is what you'll typically find on a country road, and, and you will encounter that when you're overtaking as well at those speeds, it is just something to keep tabs on. Now what's visibility like? This is obviously a big bus. Uh, I can see clearly down the front there, the bonnet is sort of well within visibility, no dramas. Big, big wing mirrors with the blind spot monitor built into those. Visibility out the back is excellent as well. So really impressed with that. You've got a stack of cameras too. So it means that if you are trying to park this in and around the city, it is going to be pretty easy to park. Turning circle of 11.8 meters as well. Now what's road noise like? Uh, it's actually quite quiet and subdued. Given they are highway terrain tires, you don't get a huge amount of noise coming in through the cabin. Uh, obviously, yeah, course chip roads, you get a little bit more, but pretty impressed with how quiet it is inside here. Now it's time to test our lane support system. So we're on our bowl. Uh, the way that it works is I'll dial up 70 k's an hour and we'll test each of the three outer lanes to see how well the lane centering system works. The Ranger passed in all three lanes, so I'm expecting this to do the exact same. So let's see how it goes. I've got cruise control set to 70 there. I'll switch on the lane centering system. Let go of the wheel. I will support it a little bit because technically you're not meant to let go of the wheel. But that is doing a perfectly good job there in the first lane. We'll jump over to lane two. Okay, wait for that to go active. Okay, that's found everything. Let go of the wheel. That is doing a good job there in lane two. We're not sort of getting too close to that line. Some of those systems, I hate it when they wedge you up on the line. If there's a B double or something there, it's the most intimidating place to be seated. So 
I'll wait for this to get its bearings. Uh, there it is there, okay. Let go of the wheel. Look at that, that is doing a remarkable job. We are close to the line. There we go, that's fixed itself up. That is awesome. So, so far we've only had a couple of cars actually be able to achieve this type of thing. So really impressed here with the Everest being able to do that. So uh, yeah, big tick for all three lanes for Everest. Okay, time to do some light off-roading. We'll see how the Everest goes. I'll run you through the specs first. So I mentioned earlier in terms of the mechanical drive modes, you have two-wheel drive, high range, four-wheel drive, automatic, four-wheel drive, high range, and four-wheel drive, low range. You also have a mechanical rear diff lock as well that you engage here on the central display. And you also have hill descent control too. In terms of our actual numbers, 226 millimeters of ground clearance. We have an approach angle of 30.2 degrees. So that's the angle of the face you can approach before you hit anything at the front of the car and a departure angle of 25 degrees which is the same but in reverse you have a weighting depth of 800 millimeters as well now if any of that doesn't make sense to you or you don't know how to use this stuff down here have a look at this video that we shot a little while back where i explain four-wheel drive controls and run you through all of it so first up what we're going to do is change our drive mode so here ahead of the driver you can flick between normal eco towing uh, slippery mud ruts sand uh, so i think we'll go to mud ruts it isn't muddy today it has dried up a little bit beneath the surface it is but i thought that'd be the best bit to have a look at how that goes i'm also going to leave this in two wheel drive high range in fact it's not going to let us do that so i'm just going to go back to normal because the first thing i want to do here is test two wheel drive high range to see how that actually performs in terms of traction control on our course so we're in two wheel drive high range traction control is on and we will see how it goes here when we get a wheel off the ground. So the first one's gonna be the driver's side rear that lifts off the ground. And we'll see how it copes with that. There it is there, so it's just off the edge of the road. I'll just lean into the throttle a little bit. See how it does, I can feel that lifting. Yeah, nice, it's actually rocking us back and forward a little, but a little bit more throttle and it gets us off the ground there without any problems at all. And then I'll ease us off the edge here. The guys at the proving ground have fixed the mess I made out here with the Raptor when I decided to leave it in two-wheel drive high range and just floor it with the stability control switched off. Um, there we go, so no drivers there. What we'll do now, we'll double back there. I'll flick it into the mud ruts mode and we'll put it in four-wheel drive high range to see how traction control copes when we have a couple of wheels off the ground. Okay, so we'll flick through these drive modes to mud ruts it switches us into four wheel drive high range on its own it locks the rear diff as well i'll just see how we go without the rear diff lock so i'll disable it by pushing that see how it copes with that terrain it's knocking about a bit okay here we go so it's in this spot just here we get a couple of wheels off the ground we'll see how it likes that i guess i can see that wheel spinning in the background there I'll just lean onto the throttle. You can hear the traction control working. Jeez, it is doing such a good job. That is awesome. So all I've done is just leaned onto the throttle and the traction control is sorting everything out. I haven't had to lock the rear diff there to get it over this. So that is really damn impressive. So yeah, good job there by the Everest. Okay, next up, we've got our hills. So what I'm gonna do here is Keep it in mud ruts, except I'll go to low range. So to get to low range, you hit 4L once. It wants us to put that into neutral. So it tells us there on the screen ahead of us. It does that shift. I'll lock the rear diff as well. It switches stability control off when it does that. Um, so I'm gonna push this button as well. So they, this brings up our terrain view. So we get our vision out the front there. We've also got the rear diff locked. I'm gonna turn the parking sensors off because they can get annoying. Uh, I'll just roll up to the hill here. And ahead of us as well, you can see all of our angles. So pitch and roll, and then exactly what the four-wheel drive system's doing. So I'm gonna go up this twice. Once is just a slow climb. And then next time around, I'll go up halfway and see how well this copes with starting. Uh, I could feel it slipping there a little bit already. Start Starting from stationary. Okay, so we're on highway terrains here and it's not loving this. So I'll just give this a little more of a nudge. There we go, we're getting there. All right, just needs a little bit more love. There we go, okay. We got there in the end. Um, all right, we've got our mud bog, we'll plow through this. All right, there it is. And then we've got our descent. Now, 
On the descent, I'm gonna use the hill descent control just to test that out. So you engage that just by pushing that button just there. It tells us hill descent control is ready and we'll see how it goes on our descent here. Coming over this hill. My camera comes in very handy here, so I'll just let go of the brake. And there it is there. It is going down nice and gently all on its own. No problems there at all. So yeah, it's impressive. I have said this before in other videos that I do prefer just to use, you know, my own descent instead of hill descent control, but it's good to know that it's there anyway. Okay, so it is time for round two on our hill. Um, yes, this time I'm gonna go up and basically just come to a stop and then just lean into the throttle and we'll see how we go getting up there. Um, it sort of didn't love going up this the first time around and I kind of had to stop anyway. So here we are, I'll stop here and we'll just lean onto the throttle and see how it goes. We're already slipping a little bit. I can see the rear wheels spinning. I'm just gonna stay in the throttle though. All right, we're getting up there, we're getting up there. There you go, that did well. So look, we had to go low range, rear diff locked for that to work, but ultimately I think it is the highway terrain tires that lets this package down. If you are gonna be doing any off-road driving, I would be going straight for the <laughs> all terrains because they're gonna make a huge amount of difference when you have limited traction. Okay, time for our rocks. Uh, obviously, yeah, I wouldn't recommend doing this with uh, highway terrain tires. Uh, I would be only doing this with all terrains, but I just wanna see what it feels like just in terms of uh, behind the wheel here. So I've just left it in low range. I'm just riding the brake with the throttle. It's actually really nice and comfy. I found with the Ranger that it was actually pretty comfy as well. Whereas this, this just feels right at home. You can kind of imagine having the whole family in here and going off and getting stuck somewhere and then getting in trouble from your wife. Um, yeah, it actually feels pretty good. Finally, our water crossing. So 800 mil waiting depth. I'm gonna get through our little bog over here to get us there. I've left it in low range just in case. It's not overly deep at the moment, but better to be safe than sorry, I reckon. Especially when it is someone else's car. So crawl around here. Okay, here we go. That's actually not too bad. It's just around 650 mil. I'll drop her in. Let's see how it goes. Feels good. I just love how you can hear it lapping around the doors. It's always slightly concerning. All right, let's see what it's like with our climb out of here on these highway terrains. Ah, it's fine. Tiny bit of slip there, but it's all good. There you go. Okay, so look, pretty impressed with Everest off-road. Same as Ranger. I mean, it just does the job really well. Uh, the only thing I would change is just if you are going to be doing any off-roading, even if it is sort of lightish stuff, just get your all-terrains. It really will make a world of difference and it means you won't be scrabbling for grip all the time. But um, outside of that, really impressed with all these four-wheel drive controls and how well the traction control system works. So the Ford Everest, look, um, I'm probably not surprising any of you by telling you that this thing is pretty awesome. I really enjoy the Ranger. I think they've done an excellent job with that. Not so much at the lower end, I think it's a bit expensive, but at the top end, if you are prepared to pay that little bit extra, you are getting a quality product. This right here creates a reason to not bother with anything else in the segment, including the Toyota Prado. The Prado just feels so old now, and it is more expensive than that with a smaller engine, less features. I mean, it just makes no sense why anyone would buy it. So I think this really is right up there. The V6 is great. And here in the Platinum trim, you're getting all of the bells and whistles. I'm looking forward to driving some of the cheaper ones. I wanna see what the Sport's like, especially with the V6. And I also wanna see what the four cylinder's like, because this probably wasn't as snappy as I thought it would be with the V6. So I'm thinking the four cylinder is probably going to feel a little bit slow, but we'll wait and see until I get a chance to finally drive that. And it's probably a little more dynamic than I thought it was gonna be as well. So let me know what you reckon in the comments section below. Did you buy a Ford Everest? How's it going? Have you tested one of these? If you bought something else, let me know what you reckon in the comments section below. If you did enjoy this video, please make sure you like it and share it with your mates because that'll help us grow. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon as well. But till next time, take it easy.